WWF SummerSlam Highway to Hell took place in New York City on the 30th of August 1998. The show sold out Madison Square Garden and an estimated 655,000 fans bought the event on pay-per-view, an impressive number that makes SummerSlam the second most successful WWF pay-per-view of the year just behind WrestleMania 14. You simply can't watch SummerSlam 98 without checking out the episode of Sunday Night Heat that aired just before the pay-per-view started. Sunday Night Heat has a lot going on that complements the show really well, so not only are we going to check out the full uncut version of SummerSlam today, we'll also look at Heat and see what went down before the big event. I want to do this one right, SummerSlam and Survivor Series are my favourite pay-per-views of 1998, so this is going to be a long and hopefully definitive review of SummerSlam 1998. Finally, if you haven't watched the show before and you want to check it out on WWE Network or Peacock, don't, don't do it. There's too much good stuff cut out due to licensing including ACDC's Highway to Hell. The theme of the pay-per-view has been completely gutted out due to the absence of the song, with loads of great hype videos also getting the axe. There's a completely unrelated live performance that's also been ripped out of the network version, and there's a few promotional videos too that didn't make the cut. Do yourself a favour and watch a restored version or the live pay-per-view version. I'm just a sexy boy. Sunday night heat begins with a great view of Madison Square Garden, and here comes the heartbreak kid returning to New York City. Check out the entranceway, the highway to hell ends right here where the superstars were going to walk through the actual gates of hell to compete inside the ring. I absolutely love the theme of this pay per view. Shawn Michaels gets in the ring as Pyro goes off, and then he takes a seat beside JR and Shane McMahon. Shawn's gonna call the action during Heat and also take part in a little promo later on. The first match that took place inside the garden was Too Much vs Animal and Darren Drozdov. Well, it was supposed to be Darren Drozdov, but Hawk came down demanding to tag up with his road warrior partner. Against his better judgement, Animal replaces Draws with Hawk, and as Too Much began beating up Animal, we see Ed standing above the entranceway, watching on and wondering why Hawk even bothered showing up. Scott Taylor performs a dropkick before Too Much get together for a double suplex. Shawn Michaels talks about Hawk and he says partying and wrestling just don't mix, and if there's anyone who has experience in this kind of stuff, it's definitely Ole HBK. Too much go for another double suplex, but Animal counters it. The Road Warrior then begins firing up with Too Sexy taking a clothesline and Taylor taking a power slam. Hawk says he's ready to go up for a doomsday device, but he ends up falling off the ropes and he lands on Animal, allowing Too Much to score the win in MSG and leaving the Road Warriors looking like absolute buffoons. How much longer can Animal put up with Hawk's issues? We cut backstage and Stone Cold's waiting for the arrival of The Undertaker and Kane. He's got himself a sledgehammer, and it looks like the WWF champ's in a real bad mood. We'll come back to Austin in a moment. Back in the ring, HBK introduces Ready, Willing and Sable. Sable's gonna team up with a mystery partner to take on Mark Merrow and Jackie tonight, and Sean wants to know who the mystery man's gonna be. Sable says the Sable bomb will get dropped on Jackie tonight, and as far as revealing her partner, Sable says it wouldn't be a secret anymore if she told HBK who it is. Sable does say that her partner isn't an oddity though, that's all she's given away. She then wants to dance with the heartbreak kid, and of course, Sean obliges. Jim Ross says Sean gets all the good assignments, and personally speaking, I would have preferred good old JR in there getting freaky with Sable. They dropped the ball with that one. Backstage, Stone Cold's still waiting for the dead man to make an appearance. Undertaker's yet to show up at MSG, but there's no way the Phenom's gonna miss a WWF title shot in the main event. Back in the arena we have another match, Gangrel vs Dustin Runnels. Gangrel goes on offense right away and we can see Dustin's wearing a shirt that says he's coming back, can't wait. Gangrel gets his face planted on the mat and there's a dropkick from Dustin too. The vamp fires back with a clothesline and a muda like elbow drop. Dustin replies by dropping Gangrel on the top rope, and look at this power slam right here from Gangrel. I can't tell if this was just well controlled or if Dustin almost got dropped on his head, maybe both. Dustin certainly looks a little shaken up after the move. We see Kevin Kelly and Tom Pritchard getting ready for SummerSlam in the WWE.com area just as Dustin drops down to uppercut his opponent. Gangrel takes multiple clotheslines, but out of nowhere Gangrel pulls off the Impaler and Dustin Runnels takes a loss on Sunday Night Heat. 
DX arrive at SummerSlam and Michael Cole wonders if the faction are having some internal issues. Triple H says DX lives for today, they don't live in the past, and after Hunter's ladder match with The Rock, things will never be the same in WWF again. Mr. McMahon's in his office and he says he's not happy with what Steve Austin's doing right now. The rattlesnake shouldn't be standing around with a sledgehammer, and McMahon wants to protect his main event and ensure the fans get what they paid for. So Vince says he's gonna go speak to Stone Cold right now. Southern Justice and Jeff Jarrett then walk to the ring and they attack Hard Finkel. The Fink gets jumped, he takes a seat on a steel chair, and he gets his head and moustache shaved by Double J. Double J faces X Pac in a hair vs hair match later tonight, and hey, at least the Fink didn't have to pay to get his hair cut. The Stooges are in the parking area trying to take the sledgehammer away from Stone Cold, and the mission is unsuccessful. The boys report back to Mr. McMahon, and Vince isn't happy that his band of merry men couldn't get the job done, so Pat Patterson tells Vince to go do it himself. Vince says that's exactly what he's gonna do. Biker Michael Likers, 8-Ball and Skull then took on Vader and Bradshaw. I'm not sure why anyone would choose to tag with Bradshaw after what he did to Terry Funk, but here we are. As expected, Big JBL couldn't play nice with his tag team partner, but check this out. Vader was clearly supposed to accidentally run into Bradshaw, but his natural instincts worked against him. It didn't look too good, did it? Anyway, Vader gets whacked by Bradshaw and Vader gets rolled up. The two big boys then have a fight on the outside that was broken up by officials, but they ended up getting back in the ring where Vader got the better of Bradshaw. We then get a good look at the Lion's Den set up in the MSG theater. Owen Hart and Kenny Boy Shamrock are gonna go to war in there a little later tonight. And then we see Vince McMahon approaching Stone Cold in the parking area, and Austin is not prepared to hand over the sledgehammer. Stone Cold says McMahon's only worried about his pay-per-view main event not getting delivered tonight, but Austin doesn't care. He's gonna stay, and he's gonna wait for The Undertaker and Kane showing up. McMahon ends up walking away, there's nothing the chairman can do. And back in the arena, The Rock and The Nation come out to cut a promo. Before The Rock gets a chance to speak, the Generation X hit the ring and a fight breaks out. Rock's able to hit Triple H on the knee before getting out of harm's way, so The Rock's already got himself an advantage for tonight's ladder match. Before he ends, Doc Hendricks presents a special Highway to Hell music video for fans in attendance and fans watching at home, and the show closes with a hearse arriving to MSG and Stone Cold demolishes it with his sledgehammer. We don't know if Undertaker and Kane are inside, but Stone Cold doesn't care. Austin even uses a forklift to do some extra damage just before heat fades to black. So it's time to begin the pay-per-view and see what went down on the Highway to Hell. Our opening pay-per-view match is for the European Championship, D'Lo vs Val Venus. This match wasn't built up on Raw at all, but here we've got two young guys getting a great opportunity in Madison Square Garden. D'Lo's improved so much in 1998, whereas I feel Val still has to show us what he can really do, but going into this one, Venus is definitely the fan favourite. Val says he's arrived at the Big Apple, he came, he saw, and he came again. Low hanging fruit there Mr Valboski, but what would I know about that? The ring announcer says Dilo now hails from Helsinki, Finland, I think he's taking this European Championship stuff a bit too seriously. Dilo gives a clean break at the ropes and we get some sportsmanship when Dilo extends his hand, you love to see it. Venus thinks he's being a nice guy by doing the same thing, but Dilo gets in a cheap shot before running away from the big Valboski, again you love to see it. Venus then hurts himself when he forearms the champ's chest protector and Dilo uses it again to his advantage, putting Val down to the mat as Jim Ross says, apparently the chest protector has been reinforced tonight. A corner splash knocks the wind out of Val Venus, but he comes back with a Russian leg sweep, a drop toe hold and a drop kick before Dilo takes a break on the outside. After getting forced back in the ring, Dilo decides to poke Venus in the eye. We then get a long Irish whip sequence with drop downs, leapfrogs, shoulder blocks, all that good stuff, but it ends with Dilo taking a spine buster. No one can gain the advantage here, Dilo counters a sleeper with a back suplex, Venus gets whipped into the corner but he comes right back with an exploder suplex. Dilo replies right away with a clothesline followed by his signature leg drop, and then finally Dilo's able to build some momentum after performing a jumping heel kick. 
The European champ puts Venus down again with a clothesline and this gets followed up with an elbow drop from the middle rope. Venus then finds himself locked in a Texas cloverleaf and this move made the crowd pop. Dilo lets it go though because he wants to try a middle rope back sent on. Unfortunately for the champ, the move misses and this gives Venus a chance to fire up a little. The fire's put out rather quickly though and Venus gets caught in mid-air with a sky high. If that's not enough, Dilo pulls off a DDT that spikes Venus's head into the canvas and the crowd pop again when Val kicks out at 2. This has been a great opening match so far. The top rope comes into play quite a bit next with Val catching Dilo this time around for a power slam and Val then goes for the money shot only to come crashing down into Dilo's knees. Dilo then goes for a power bomb but he's unable to get Val up and yeah that wasn't great was it? Definitely looked a bit dangerous. Dilo tries again and he pulls off a running sit down power bomb. He then goes upstairs and he misses his low down frog splash and the match comes to an end when Venus puts Dilo on the mat and he removes Dilo's chest protector. Venus decides to put the chest protector on and go for the money shot one more time but the referee ends up accidentally causing Val to smash his wee Val Boski on the top rope. Venus gets a chance to try again and again the referee tries to stop him so Val shoves Jimmy Cordes and Venus gets disqualified. Dilo grabs his chest protector in the European title, he gets out of the ring and Val Venus decides to give the referee a money shot for costing him the European championship. A good opener here, the powerbomb botch was a little dodgy but apart from that this was a good showing from Venus and Dilo. Michael Cole gives us an update on the hearse that Steve Austin wrecked during Sunday Night Heat. It was Mick Foley's special Summer Slam ride, not The Undertaker and Kane's. Mick says this is great news for the Briscoe Brothers body shop but it's not good news for mankind. So maybe Mick's gonna take it out on someone tonight and maybe he'll get a chance to use this sledgehammer that he found at the crime scene. Up next we have a 4 on 3 handicap match, The Oddities vs Kai and Tai. ICP repurposed their song The Great Show and they wrap a new version that serves as The Oddities entrance music and you know what, say what you want about ICP. But the audience get into it and they'd continue to get more into it as the weeks progress. By the next pay per view, the whole crowd are waving their hands and singing along. Kai and Tai watch the entrance backstage and they make fun of the oddities on their way to the ring. But Taka, Show, Teo, and Togo are dealing with three big dudes tonight, and it starts off with Golga smacking his own head on the top turnbuckle before headbutting Taka. Big John Tenta takes out every member of Kai and Tai before grabbing one of Mr. Yamaguchi's sneakers. He then fills it up with water and he throws it over Kai and Tai's manager. I, uh, okay. Big Kurgan comes in and he gets on his knees to mock Sho Funaki. Kurgan then dominates Sho while dancing in between offense. And even when all of Kai and Tai try to work together to bring the big man down, they simply can't get the job done. If they can't beat one guy, how are they going to beat all three? We see the law of physics getting defied when Mr. Yamaguchi tries to get involved. Not sure what this was all about. But here comes the giant Silva to do some damage next. Kai and Tai decide to get out of the ring and after a little debate, it's Dick Togo who tries his luck but he instantly gets thrown back to his corner, so all of Kantai try once again to team up on one of their opponents and again it doesn't work. Jan Silva lines the faction up in the corner, they all get thrown to the opposite corner, Silva then gorilla presses Taga out of the ring and you know the match isn't great, even Jim Ross says they didn't promise a classic here, but the MSG crowd love all these little spots and remember this is usually a pretty tough crowd to please. Teo and Funaki are able to body slam Golga and every member of Kantai takes to the sky for some rapid fire aerial attacks. We then get a conveyor belt of elbow drops from Kantai, but all this hard work gets thrown away when Golga performs a quadruple clothesline. It ends when Kurgan performs a sidewalk slam and he and Silva set all four Kantai members up for choke slams. Luna runs in to make sure Mr. Yamaguchi doesn't interfere and Kantai all get planted. Golga covers all four men and ICP perform the great show again after the oddities win the match. You can tell it was a heavily rehearsed matchup in terms of the spots used and I wouldn't say it was a very good match either, but the audience had fun and it looked like the competitors had fun too.
HBK is with Doc Hendricks promoting the WWF Superstar line. The loser of the next match is going to get shaved bald and Sean says you don't get any chicks when you don't look cool. It's not like Shawn Michaels is going to go bald, he's going to stay like this forever. Double J and X-Pac make their way down to the ring, Southern Justice come down with Jarrett and the freshly shaved hard Fingal accompanies X-Pac. The Fink even gets involved with X-Pac's pyro routine. Not much story between these two really, X-Pac took a leak in Double J's cowboy boots on Raw this past week so there's that I guess. This is apparently a new Jeff Jarrett. The second time WWF's promoted Jarrett is new or reborn yet the only thing different this time around is that he shaves people's heads it seems. Finkel tells Double J to suck it before the action begins. X-Pac strikes first after going up and over following a hip toss counter and Kid performs a spinning wheel kick. Double J ends up on the outside and X-Pac performs a crossbody from the middle rope. Jeff tries to get back in with a sunset flip but Kid walks away and Jarrett crashes on his back. Jarrett performs two drop kicks, the second knocks X-Pac out of the ring. X-Pac then gets his ball smashed into the ring post and this one keeps Waltman on the floor for a bit, it's not surprising. Fink checks on X-Pac before the match gets back in the ring. X-Pac gets sent to the corner and Double J nails him with a big uppercut. And seriously, X-Pac doesn't get enough credit for his corner Irish whip bumps. We praise Brett and Owen a lot for these but X-Pac took him well too. Double J performs a power slam and he tries another corner whip. This time Kid counters and he pulls off a tornado DDT. X-Pac fires up in the corner and Jeff takes a few kicks, but Jared pulls off a sleeper and X-Pac gets brought down to the mat. The Fink shouts at Waltman to fight it and when X-Pac gets to his feet he's able to lock in a sleeper of his own, though he ends up getting crotched on the top rope. X-Pac fights Jeff off, he goes for a crossbody, Double J sees it coming and X-Pac crashes to the mat. He gets up and he tries a spinning wheel kick, but again he hits the canvas. It's time for the figure 4, the crowd boos as Double J locks in his signature hold and he keeps it in for a very long time. It kinda kills the move when someone can stay in it for this long without submitting but Jarrett lets go after Waltman reaches the ropes. Jeff goes for it one more time but X-Pac counters and Jarrett takes a back suplex. After taking a rest, the two get up and X-Pac pulls off an excellent spinning back kick on Double J. This gets followed up with a crowd pleasing bronco buster and when Double J comes off the top rope X-Pac tries to score a pinfall victory but Jeff kicks out. Waltman then counters a hurricane rana attempt with a sit down powerbomb but Pac also tears himself a new one when he misses the rare standing bronco buster. X-Pac then gets his bronco busted when Double J kicks him in the nuts and the thing takes a punch to the face too when he gets on the apron. Jeff turns around and he walks into an X factor and this leads to Southern Justice returning to ringside holding Jarrett's chair. Dennis Knight swings at X-Pac but Pac dodges it. Waltman then takes the guitar and he breaks it over Jarrett's head. X-Pac wins via pinfall and it's now time to cut Jarrett's hair. The outlaws run down to make sure Jarrett can't escape, Darren Drozdov and the headbangers run down too to help X-Pac out and unfortunately those clippers that X-Pac's got aren't too good, it takes ages for any hair to come off. The babyfaces end up using scissors, even the Fink gets in on the action and there you go, the beautiful golden locks of Jeff Jarrett aren't so beautiful anymore. Check it out, we see Method Man in attendance for SummerSlam, I don't know, it looks like he's a fan of D-Generation X. Doc Hendricks is in the MSG theatre and we get another look at the lion's den. That match is coming up soon and I've often wondered how fans got into the theatre for this match. Uh, through the front door Ryan? <laughs> yes I know. I mean were fans plucked out of the main arena to go downstairs or were fans given free tickets outside? Let me know in the comments if you attended SummerSlam. Michael Cole's backstage with the IC champ and Cole wants to know what Rock was thinking when he hit Triple H on the knee earlier with the IC title. After telling Cole he'll smack the yellow off his teeth, Rock says there's no way Hunter can climb the people's ladder with only one leg. Tonight in MSG, Rock's gonna prove he's the people's champ, the people's choice and the best damn intercontinental champion there ever was, if you smell what the Rock's cooking. Back in the arena, we have a mixed tag team match, Mark Merrow and Jackie vs Sable and her mystery partner. Sable gets in the ring, she introduces her partner and it's Edge. I remember thinking back then that Edge was a weird choice and nothing comes of this either in terms of storyline. I still think Sable should have went with Steve Mavug and Blackman but who am I to make such critical decisions at a pay per view. Edge takes Mero down with a flat head scissors followed by two Japanese arm drags. Mero then quickly tags out and Jackie wants no part of Sable at all so Mero comes back in and Edge performs a flapjack. 
Jackie distracts Edge and this allows Mero to momentarily take control. Mero performs a knee lift. He and Jackie choke Edge at the ropes and Mero tries to end it with a TKO but Edge counters with a DDT. Sable and Jackie then get tagged in and the loudest pop of the night so far comes when Sable starts laying it into Jackie. Sable punches, kicks and throws her opponent around the ring and she even manages to take Mero out on the apron. But Marvelous Mark still manages to save his partner at the cost of a low blow and a potential Sable bomb. Luckily for Mark, Jackie intervened. Sable's able to plant Jackie with a TKO and Mero breaks the cover. The heels get the upper hand briefly on the outside but Jackie gets clocked back in the ring before Edge tags in. Edge jumps over the top rope and onto Mero. Mark gets thrown into the ring steps and when Jackie tries to jump on Edge's back she gets brought up the entranceway and she uh, she gets spanked by Edge. Mark and Edge then do a little work in the ring. Mark takes a top rope neck breaker and he replies at the other side of the ring with a Samoan drop. Mark then goes up for his moonsault but he ends up getting his little wild man smashed on the top rope and Edge tags in Sable. Sable performs a top rope Frankensteiner that King calls a Sable Canrana. The crowd went absolutely crazy for this move by the way and they broke out in a loud Sable chant. Jackie jumps off the top rope but she lands on Marvelous Mark and Jackie does even more damage when she and Mero go through the inadvertent headbutt to the ball spot though to be honest we've seen this done a whole lot better. Mark takes a downward spiral and the match ends with Sable splashing Mero with a little help from Edge. No, no that didn't sound right did it? Uh, an assisted uh, wheelbarrow splash, yeah that'll do. What stands out here is how popular Sable was in the garden. When people say Sable was over in WWF it's absolutely no exaggeration. Edge leaves the ring and he goes back through the audience, Sable waves at the fans and SummerSlam continues on with a few promos. This promo has been removed from WWE Network, The Undertaker talking about his upcoming title match. Taker says from day one he told Stone Cold he stands alone and when their match takes place tonight the dead man will be alone once again. The question is, is Austin ready to face The Undertaker standing alone tonight in the garden? Seriously, this is what he said, he stands alone, he stands alone tonight and is Austin ready for The Undertaker to stand alone? I can see why this was cut out actually, a rare swing and a miss from The Undertaker. Michael Cole puts two and two together when interviewing Mick Foley. It sounds like Kane isn't here tonight. So Michael wants to know what Mankind's gonna do in regards to his tag team title match. Mick says he lost his car, his tag team partner, he even lost his sledgehammer. So maybe he should just forfeit the match. When Michael says the fans want their money's worth, Mick suggests Cole teams up with Mankind tonight. The two can get their asses kicked all over the garden and then Mick can go outside and play in traffic. That should appease these bloodthirsty fans in New York. Vince McMahon appears, he tries to calm Mankind down by telling him it'll be okay, but Mick knows he's gonna get killed out there. McMahon reminds Foley about hitchhiking to the garden, how Mick would wait for autographs on 33rd street. This is New York City, it's history, and Mick Foley belongs inside the ring. If one man can defend the tag titles in this arena then Foley will get put in the MSG Hall of Fame within a week and it looks like Foley's interested in this kind of immortality. So Vince grabs Mick a few weapons and Mick says he's got 13 words for the outlaws. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? The Lions then matches up next, Owen Hart vs Ken Shamrock. Dan Severn has been training Owen Hart, Severn was once a member of the Mavug Dojo but both he and Ken Shamrock left Sensei Blackman to carve their own paths in the world of mixed martial arts. Blackman taught these boys everything they know, remember that. Severn has been passing his wisdom on to Owen Hart and Owen has got a chance to show off his newfound skills inside this unique cage in the MSG theatre. The WWF were capitalizing on the popularity of mixed martial arts in the UFC with this one and like the dungeon match at Fully Loaded, I actually enjoyed this for how different it was. The cage comes into play right away with Shamrock forcing Owen into the steel before bringing him down with an armbar. Owen gives as good as he gets and Kenny Boy gets slammed to the mat before taking a few punches, though Shamrock's able to get in a few punches of his own. Shamrock then pulls off a back suplex, Severn watches on as Owen gets put in a chokehold, the Blackheart performs a low blow on the world's most dangerous man but Shamrock replies with a hard clothesline. Owen takes a few knees to the face and we can see Owen's been busted open as Ken performs another clothesline. Owen then gets choked with his own shirt and the crowd pops when Shamrock launches himself off the cage and Owen takes a jumping body attack. 
This is what they needed to do in this match, I feel. Use that lion's den as much as possible. Owen gets launched into the cage and he takes a high hip lock takeover. And from here it's all Owen as Ken gets rammed into the steel cage over and over again. Owen performs an enziguri before throwing Ken into the lion's den a few times. This spot right here with Owen dropping Ken into the cage looked good. Shamrock takes a backbreaker and Dan Severn watches on as Owen tries a pile driver but Shamrock counters it. Owen then tries a sharpshooter and a hurricane rana but on both occasions Shamrock was able to fight Owen off. Ken gets confident and he tries to jump off the side of the cage again but this time Owen counters with a power slam. After delivering a belly to belly suplex Owen's able to lock in that sharpshooter and Shamrock tries to break free by climbing up the cage and it works too. Shamrock breaks free and he uses the lion's den to DDT Owen and the match comes to an end when Owen applies that dragon sleeper that Severn taught him. Kenny Boy knew this was coming so he walks up the cage and he flips over Owen, a spectacular counter indeed. Owen then gets taken down with an arm bar, Ken applies the ankle lock and Owen looks to Dan Severn for help but Severn walks away from his student. The Blackheart has no choice but to tap out so Ken Shamrock wins the SummerSlam 1998 Lions Den match. Good fun, I would have liked to see the cage get utilised a bit more or even a fight on the cage boardwalk would have been good, but I'm sure they were saving a few spots for future Lions Den matchups. No complaints about this one, it's another unique match from Owen Hart and Ken Shamrock. Michael Cole tells Stone Cold Steve Austin that The Undertaker is all alone tonight at SummerSlam and Austin says he doesn't trust anybody so Undertaker can say what he wants. While Steve respects The Undertaker more than anyone in the World Wrestling Federation, Austin won't be afraid to cheap shot his way to a victory tonight if it means holding on to the WWF title. Next we have the tag team title match which is now a 2 on 1 bout, The Outlaws vs Mankind. Mankind's gonna try to defend the belts all on his own but Billy and Road Dog have something else in mind. Road Dog says they're gonna do it old school style, they're wearing their old South Park shirts and they bring a dumpster to the ring, a reminder of what happened to Mankind and Terry Funk back in February. This Falls Count Anywhere match began with Mankind hitting the Outlaws with a silver platter presented to Mankind by Vince McMahon. Mankind and Billy Gunn then fight with steel chairs like their swords, but the numbers game comes into play very early on and the Outlaws quickly gain the advantage. Road Dog and Mr. Ass take turns at smacking poor Mick with metal trays and Road Dog hits Mick with a metal bow. Looks like that dumpster's filled with all sorts of toys. Quite a few fans are chanting for Foley here and it's easy to see why. Babyfaces with an unfair advantage isn't typically done so Mick's naturally gonna get sympathy but this was all very much by design. Mick's able to get Mr. Ass out of the ring and Road Dog gets a tray kneed in his face. It goes to the outside where Foley tries to suplex Road Dog but Mick ends up getting the back of his head whacked on that dumpster. Back in the ring Road Dog sets up a table as the crowd chant ECW but it's Billy Gunn who takes the bump and Jesse James also gets put on the canvas. The Outlaws get right back up for a back suplex neckbreaker combo and this is where the match ends. Mankind gets powerbombed through two steel chairs and when the Outlaws don't get the pinfall victory they hit Mick with a spike pile driver. The Outlaws win via pinfall and it's almost like Foley never had a chance. Road Dog announces that the Outlaws are the new tag team champions of the world and Billy Gunn says Mankind's getting put in the garbage where he belongs. The Outlaws put Mick in the dumpster they then return to the ring but Kane appears from inside the dumpster and he drops a sledgehammer on Foley's head. Lucky for us we don't get a clear view of this violent act. Kane then brings poor Mick Foley back up the entranceway, it's a bad night for mankind in New York City. Triple H gets a shot at The Rock's IC title next in a ladder match, the first televised WWF ladder match since SummerSlam 1995. DX and The Nation have been feuding over the past few months and things heated up when Rock attacked Hunter with a ladder following a street fight two weeks ago. On this past episode of Raw, The Rock was about to make Mark Henry kiss China while DX were locked up in their dressing room but HBK made the save just in time. So things have gotten pretty personal going into this one. Chris Warren and the DX band played the DX theme song during Hunter's entrance and gotta say, it's not the best live performance I've ever heard. It's definitely cool when a band plays a wrestler down to the ring and Chris's voice was the same as always but it wasn't brilliant or anything. The Rock debuts his new theme music here and it's much more pleasant to the 
years. This is the one featured on WWF Volume 3 and it's pretty awesome. Many people see this match as the turning point for The Rock. This is the match that solidified his spot as the future great one in WWF. And many people see this as Triple H's best performance up until this point. Two very, very hungry dudes who wanted to be in the main event spot and two dudes who earned that right following this absolute classic in MSG. The bell gets raised above the ring, The Rock talks some trash to Triple H and here we go, the IC title ladder match at SummerSlam 98. Triple H comes at Rock with a hard clothesline followed by the face breaker knee smash. Rock then tries a rock bottom but Hunter frees himself. Triple H goes for a pedigree but Rock dumps him out of the ring, so it's a very strong start to the match with both men trying to do big damage early on. Rock then goes for the ladder but Hunter stops him from doing so, Triple H stays in control on the entranceway, in his strategies to soften Rock up a little more before bringing the ladder into the match. So it goes back to the ring where Rock takes a Harley race knee, Hunter thinks this is enough to slow Rock down but Hunter was wrong. The champ nails the challenger from behind and Hunter falls into the ladder, this time it's Rocky doing all the damage at the entranceway with Hunter getting his head smacked on the guardrail and following this he gets launched into the ladder while it was set up against the apron. Rock brings the ladder back in the ring, it's time to reclaim the belt but Triple H wakes up and he comes off the top rope with a forearm to the back. Rock falls down but the ladder also falls down onto Triple H. You may think this was accidental but if you look closely you can see Rocky pushing the ladder, both men's timing was just picture perfect. The two men get up, Triple H swings the ladder at Rocky and he drills it into the champ's chest. Hunter then tries to get the belt but Rock remembers the injured knee and Hunter gets pulled down quite abruptly. Rock sets the ladder to the side and the people's champ refocuses on the knee joint. After a few shots Rock brings the ladder back to do even more damage and not only does Rock drop the ladder across Hunter's leg, he closes the ladder over Hunter's leg before letting the boots in. When Triple H is still trapped the Rock grabs a chair and it's more hard shots to the injured body part. Jim Ross says the referee may just make a judgement call call here and call the match off if this continues, but Kyoto lets it slide when Rock performs a knee breaker on the ladder which was set up between the steps and the guardrail. The Rock thinks he's done enough to win this match, he climbs up to get the belt but Triple H gets back in the ring and he runs into the champ. A beaten up Triple H then decides he wants to use that ladder on the outside but the plan backfires when Rocky performs a catapult. After this it looks like Triple H wants to crawl away and give it up but he fires back on the entranceway and he's able to stun Rock long enough to set up a pedigree on the ladder. Unfortunately for Hunter, the Rock counters and Hunter takes a backdrop. This right here looks particularly painful. Mark Henry slides a second ladder into the ring and what we get next are many, many attempts by both men at grabbing the IC title. Mark Henry holds Triple H while Rock tries to grab the belt but China comes over to even the odds. Triple H pushes Rock off and the champ falls to the outside. Hunter then performs a baseball slide into the ladder and Rock gets busted open pretty badly. But that doesn't stop the people's champ from getting back in the ring to stop his opponent from retrieving the IC championship belt. Rock lays in a few of those signature right hands. He sets a ladder up across the top turnbuckle but Rock's forced to counter an Irish whip with a DDT and that ladder is going to stay put for a moment. The Rock climbs up the other ladder, Triple H follows, the two trade punches and it's Hunter who ends up taking the dive. Triple H falls onto that second ladder but he bounces back and he stops Rock from winning the match. The crowd applaud both competitors as the match continues on. China hands Hunter a steel chair, Rock grabs the ladder and it's Hunter who does all the damage here. Is this enough to stop Rocky? No, absolutely not. The Rock body slams Hunter onto the ladder, he takes the elbow pad off and it's after this people's elbow where the crowd begins chanting Rocky's name. It's not Rocky sucks anymore, the thousands in attendance and the millions watching at home are rooting for the great one. Hunter stops Rock from climbing the ladder with a kick to the midsection. Triple H climbs up, he jumps down when Rock's about to stop him, but the champ pulls off the Rock bottom. Rock's gonna dig deep to try and get that title belt back. Hunter wakes up, he pulls Rock down by the tights, and there's a pedigree. There is nothing more these two can do, this has been insanely good. Mark Henry throws some of that Shawn Michaels sugar into Triple H's face, the game's been blinded, but he still tries to climb up and reach the belt. Rock punches Hunter a few times and the challenger slips down a few rungs and this leads to China hitting the ring and the Rock takes a low blow. Triple H then grabs the IC title and the crowd lose their shit. 
What a match. And you know what? This proves that you don't need crazy spots to pull off a good ladder match. This one just wasn't good though. It's an absolute all-timer. A very, very physical match that both men benefited from. Jim Ross calls it one of the most outstanding matches he's ever witnessed. And it really is one of those matches you have to watch for yourself from start to end to truly appreciate. No joke, I think this is a match of the year contender for 1998. Steve Austin vs The Undertaker is our main event, and their story's been quite a peculiar one that's focused mainly on the dead man's relationship with his little brother. Remember back at King of the Ring when Undertaker cost Austin the championship? Well, since then, the big question's been the same every week on Raw. Is The Undertaker actually working alongside his little brother and have the Brothers of Destruction finally united? After some questionable moments on Raw, including the brothers wearing each other's attires, Undertaker getting spotted entering Kane's locker room, and Kane unwillingness to back up his tag team partner Mankind, it was heavily implied that the dead man was indeed in cahoots with the big red machine. And this past week on Raw, it was completely confirmed when the brothers walked side by side at the beginning of the show. The Undertakers made it clear that the highway to hell ends in a clean, no-nonsense fight. On Raw, things got a bit more personal when Austin cheap shot a cane from behind, but Undertaker feels he took care of that issue at the end of the show. The question is though, will The Undertaker go back on his word and will the big red machine play a role in this main event match? We're gonna find out in a moment. This is still a pretty big main event when you take all this storyline out of the equation. You've got arguably the two most popular superstars in the WWF squaring off in a big four main event. You've got two badasses who like to fight, and as time would prove, we're gonna see two great legends of WWF doing their thing in Madison Square Garden. Everyone else had to open the gates of hell to make their way down to the ring, but they swing open on their own for The Undertaker, a nice touch that seems to go unnoticed. We're inching closer and closer to the Ministry of Darkness Undertaker, and I can't wait for that either. A pane of glass shatters as Stone Cold makes his way into the garden, and this time around, the WWF get the timing quite well. Good job. Both men get great crowd reactions, and it starts off with Austin striking The Undertaker, a game that Stone Cold probably can't win. Taker counters and Austin takes a few shots to the jaw, and when Austin tries to fight back, the dead man launches him into the corner and Stone Cold takes a clothesline. A lot of fire to start this one off. Austin defiantly flips the Undertaker off and the two lock up again. And check this out, Stone Cold works the wrist. He moves into a pin attempt and he pulls off a drop toe hold followed by an armbar. Shades of the old Stone Cold before his neck injury. Austin then moves into a hammerlock and Taker stands up when Austin moves back to an armbar. Things were going so well, but then disaster strikes when The Undertaker flips his head up and he catches Stone Cold right on the chin, knocking the champ out cold for a few moments. Austin said he had to ask Earl Hebner where he was and Earl told him he was in the garden, and Stone Cold also said he couldn't remember much about this match when all was said and done. You can tell too that Austin isn't right as The Undertaker tries to buy him some time by putting him back on the mat. I wouldn't say Austin days during the match, he's definitely a bit more loose than before, but give him credit, he's gonna see this match through until the end. Austin takes a stun gun and Erd checks on Austin again. Jerry Lawler even mentions that Austin isn't quite right as Taker lays in a few shots in the corner. Austin gets launched to the opposite corner and he crumbles to the mat after taking the impact, though he's able to slide out of the ring and do some damage to Taker's left leg and knee, the old Bret Hart strategy. Back in the ring, you can tell Austin's still struggling a little with his coordination, but he takes a jump and clothesline perfectly. Undertaker then begins weakening up Austin's shoulder while torquing up the wrist, so you know what the dead man's gonna go for now. Next. Undertaker keeps the wrist lock in as he goes for old school, but Steve Austin throws his opponent off the top rope. It rarely happens, but it looked good. As Austin focuses on Taker's leg, we see the big red machine walking down the entranceway, and this can't be good. The Undertaker lives up to his word though, and he sends his brother back up the ramp. This is gonna be a one on one match, and the best man should leave as champion. Kane backs off, and Taker invites Austin in for a slugfest. Stone Cold falls over while throwing punches, but he recovers quickly by grabbing grabbing The Undertaker's foot, and like before, Taker again gets punished at the ring apron. Austin wants to make sure Kane's gone, but he walks straight into a choke slam. a choke slam from the apron back into the ring. Undertaker's not able to capitalize though, he's selling that bad knee, so Austin clotheslines Undertaker out of the ring and we get some brawling at the commentary table, at the entranceway, and all the way through the crowd inside the garden.
back in the ring, the challenger quickly leaves again when Austin goes for a stunner. Turns out this was a smart move because Austin follows the dead man and he ends up getting his back rammed into the ring post. Undertaker punishes Austin in the ring and I truly think Undertaker was still trying to buy Austin some time here, but Stone Cold ends up getting launched back out of the ring and the way he lands is really awkward. Undertaker clears up the Spanish announce table, he sets Austin on it and he chokes the champ out. Undertaker then climbs up to the top rope and Stone Cold said he couldn't remember if he had to stay on the table right here or move out of the way. He totally forgot the spot so he decides to stay and well the spots still look great either way. Undertaker brings Austin back to the ring, he covers the champ and Austin kicks out. Stone Cold looks like a mess as he crawls on the mat trying to get himself up. He dodges a corner attack but Undertaker stays on him and Austin's hardly able to stand up at this point. Still, a double clothesline puts both men down and when the two get up it's Stone Cold throwing right hands and the Phenom takes a Luthez press in the middle of the ring. Again, Austin's not out yet. He tries a stunner but he doesn't get all of it. I think Taker was trying to counter here by bringing Austin to the mat really fast but it didn't look that good. Pay attention though and you'll see it was the Undertaker who dropped first. The dead man makes Austin pay with a choke slam, and the crowd roars when the challenger signals for a tombstone. The move gets countered, but Austin's stunner attempt also gets countered. Taker's eventually able to put Stone Cold down though with a Russian leg sweep. The match then comes to an end when Taker goes for old school one more time and again he fails to pull off the move. This time the challenger stopped with a low blow from Stone Cold. Austin's then able to successfully hit Undertaker with a stunner and we get Earl Hebner's signature slow deliberate three count to end the war. Austin retains at SummerSlam 1998. This match disappointed both Austin and Undertaker and both men knew they could do better, but I still like it quite a bit because you've got a guy in there completely messed up yet he's still able to pull off a main event match. Granted it's not his best performance, but seeing Stone Cold's determination to see it through and seeing Taker and Earl help Austin through the match, I thought that was pretty cool to see. The pay per view ends with Undertaker handing Austin the belt and Taker nods his head at the champ, showing his approval and thanking Austin for the fight. Kane then joins his brother on the rampway as Austin celebrates his victory and that's SummerSlam all over. This is one of my favourite pay per views of the year. Everything on this card was good to great with the only slight hiccup being the oddities match but you can still watch that one just fine and have fun with it you know. Hunter and Rock stole the show, X-Pac and Jarrett was also very good, I enjoyed the Lions Den match, I enjoyed the opener, the main event gets unfairly put down I feel, yeah great show from the WWF here, I actually rank this one higher than Wrestlemania 14. Thank you very very much for watching, I know it was a long one but as mentioned I wanted to cover everything that happened at this event. You really can't go wrong with SummerSlam 1998 and it comes highly recommended. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens next with Stone Cold, Undertaker and Kane. Is this storyline going to continue or is someone new going to come knocking on Austin's door? Join me next Thursday for Reliving the War and we'll see what's up. Thanks again for watching guys and please take care.